Most of the work I share with you today is uh, spearheaded by my colleagues Isnaldi Filo Sousa and Jan Mahm, and you see their faces here, and they uh, run corresponding research groups here at the Max Planck Institute. And uh, we receive funding from different agencies, which is highly appreciated. And I started with a couple of slides to frame the challenge a little bit broader. So when we talk about the circular economy, then this would in principle mean that every atom that we use in products and so on and services would at some point re-enter the manufacturing cycle, quite obviously. And there are different facets that uh, Come into play. That is, of course, efficiency uh, aspects. It is, of course, the what we call indirect sustainability, where we provide and develop materials, for instance, for the electrification for electrical vehicles like batteries and uh, magnets and so on, and the many materials you would need for green technologies. But also another aspect is longevity. That means something that does not have to be scrapped in the first place does not have to be replaced. So longevity, corrosion, hydrogen embrittlement are very essential topics also, also here at the Max Planck Institute. And from a materials design perspective, it is also very interesting to contemplate about opportunities to design materials more tolerant for recycling. That is, uh, I show you later one example that is also quite important. But the main message pertaining to the theme of this presentation is that when you take all these aspects into account, um, the markets, the global markets over the next 30 years will go much more than anything we could replenish by using, for instance, scrap, um, because the markets are simply growing more than the scrap is available. And that means we need a huge fraction of the material being made from primary synthesis, from minerals, from reduction. And that is where these enormous CO2 emissions coming from. Currently, we are at a global average um, when we take the biggest polluters like steel, aluminum, nickel, copper, and so on, um, standing for about, um, you know, only about one third of the material being made from scrap, where about two thirds, however, come from this primary synthesis. And that is that is a real challenge that we that we have today. Just to give you a feeling for the magnitude, when we take a picture that is 10 years old by now and you appreciate the quantity of iron that has been produced 10 years ago, that could bury a town like Pittsburgh beneath it, just to give you a feeling of the quantities uh, that are annually produced. And this is a forecast where you, uh, of course, can appreciate and see that this will even drastically grow. So most of these materials that we use today and that are biggest CO2 polluters will in the consumption more than double by the next 20 or 30 years. So these problems become even much, much bigger than they are today. And the acceleration factors, I think, are mostly clear to most of you. It's not just population growth, quite obviously, but it is particularly the uh, GDP. Um, because, and that is not so much the GDP here like in Europe or the US, it's, it's really the GDP of the poor countries of so, you know, Asia, Africa, South America where you know, the escape from poverty leads to a drastic increase of the per capita consumption of all of these metal goods. And then we have a rebound effect through the green energy that we are building up because many of these technologies are much more material intense than, than classical fossil-based technologies. And they, however, the materials that we need are currently, of course, produced with the technology we have today. So that, again, boosts the CO2 emissions. And then infrastructure. Um, globally, we, we build a lot of infrastructure. In Germany, we, we are not very good at building things, of course, and Germany is a very small country. But when you take a global view, then more than 50%, for instance, of all the structural materials, like concrete and steel and so on, go, of course, into infrastructure. And at some point, what we see already today in Netherlands or England or Indonesia uh, comes coastal protection. When waters are rising due to global warming, then you start protecting the coasts against flooding. And that will lead to huge consumptions of steel and of concrete. So these are the acceleration factors that are in principle well known. And just this rebound effect that I mentioned, this is an important topic for us also. 
uh, when you just imagine a three megawatt turbine, something of the size, you know, exceeding bigger than the uh, Kölner Dom, than the Cologne Cathedral, for instance, uh, but this is a standard turbine today, then you consume more than 300 tons of steels or more than 1,000 tons of concrete and so on, and other precious metals for the magnet and so on. So that creates a big rebound effect of additional CO2 emissions. And the recycling, as you see here from the windmill blades, is, is, is not solved at all. So um, in other words, these technologies, they serve, of course, when they operate for reducing the CO2 emissions drastically, of course, that is very essential. But making them at the moment, uh, like also electrical vehicles, is not sustainable at all. And that, that is part of the overall research that we, of course, want to embrace the challenges of manufacturing to make the production of these green technologies also sustainable. There's a nice quote here from Elon Musk, uh, which, however, is, is, is quite true. He was pledging for a giant contract, as he put it, for selling him sustainable nickel, of course, for the cathodes, for the electrodes in the, in the vehicle batteries. And nickel is one of the most dirtiest metals you can produce. And details are a bit complicated. It has to do with the dilution and the processes, the chemical operations associated. But the CO2 footprint of nickel, just to give you flavor, is a factor of 10 higher than the carbon footprint of, of steel manufacturing. So these are huge challenges that apply not only to steel or aluminum, but they apply in principle to the entire parallel uh, system. We must make the synthesis of all of these materials more sustainable. And when you just get a bit closer to actual steel associated topics, then you see also a large variety of possible feedstocks that we encounter. And it's not only the use of high grade ores, namely of very pure hematite or magnetite being iron oxides, but also the use of more polluted iron oxides, for instance, like silicon containing so-called banded iron oxides that are much less expensive. And in part in some areas of the world that are big steel producers, for instance, are those that are available. That means when we have to more or less reinvent the synthesis of metals anyway, then one should take on the screen also the use of, uh, of more polluted feedstock materials and of course of all kinds of scraps, multi-element scraps and even industry waste. That's something that we call tertiary uh, synthesis um, and that refers to industry, dumped industry material and bring it back into the manufacturing loop. And the fastest way to uh, decarburize industry manufacturing and like steel making and auto making and so on uh, is of course to use higher scrap fractions. But as I said in the beginning, we currently have globally only one third of the material coming from scrap simply due to availability. And the problem is that what is often underestimated, read articles about the circular economy and so on, that some of the metals that we produce today have a high longevity. Uh, you can, from a drinking can, for instance, from your beer can, you can get the material back to the shelf within a few weeks, actually, uh, when you used it. Uh, from a car, we you know have 15 years. Uh, for a building, uh, it can be 100 to 150 years. That means uh, there's a huge um, amount of scrap that will come back to us uh, in, in 30, 40, 100 years, but we need that material now for decarburization. So that is also something you must blend in. The second aspect is shown now not for steel, but for aluminum, but the principle is, is the same, is shown in this uh, movie. This is an atom probe tomographic um, experiment where the single dots indicate the different atoms that you would find, for instance, in the drinking can. When you drink a, you know, a soft drink and analyze the material, it should be essentially aluminum, relatively pure aluminum with a little bit of manganese. But you find up to 15 different elements nowadays in packaging aluminum, which all comes from the included scrap from the mixed uh, material that you get from the post-consumer scrap. So the second assignment, the second challenge is that the scrap is becoming incredibly dirty. It's becoming incredibly mixed and you must blend these considerations in when you do thermodynamics and kinetics that you are suddenly dealing with material development, um, uh, you know, with 10, 15 elements and must do the thermodynamics of such systems, which is very complicated when you build a plane or a car, 
on ICE train or so, you know, you must blend this in and must make predictions about uh, the durability of such compounds. So it's, it's really challenging uh, to deal with scrap. Scrap is absolutely a complicated business to do science with. Um, another aspect that is uh, often forgotten is when we talk about the synthesis that are projected about making new metals, then we need gigantic amounts of mineral oxides. Uh, just last year, you see that number, we talk about 3 billion tons of iron oxide, iron ore that is used to make about 1.9 billion tons of steels. So, and that again, when you multiply this about by a factor of 10, then you have the amount of material that is moved when mining and digging and uh, producing dump waste and so on. That means the leverage of producing metals uh, from primary synthesis is, is really gigantic. And that applies here as a typical picture. That is, for instance, a dump waste feedstock. That is the so called red mud. That is a slurry consisting of uh, aluminum, iron, and titanium. It's a byproduct from the aluminum industry. And we try, for instance, to produce iron from this type of dumped waste. Now, when you see where in other countries that is just dumped into the jungle or in the desert, that is incredible what is, uh, what is really done in industry to, to get rid of, this, of these waste products. So it's not only the synthesis, the primary synthesis or reduction physics that I mentioned to you, but it's also the entire setting, the entire byproduct. It's a question of what do we do with all the dumped waste that nobody takes care of and that for this case of the red mud has piled up to the amount of meanwhile more than 4 billion tons uh, on the planet, which is used by no one and it's poisoning just the, the environment. So I think the assignment goes, goes far beyond just dealing with the synthesis. Now let's get a little bit closer to the main theme after that introduction and appetizing. Um, here you see the projected growth for the manufacturing of the steels in future, we expect around 2050, a total annual volume of about 2.8 billion tons of steel produced every year. So as I said, when you when you deal with this, these topics, you must always understand that you deal with very, very, very big numbers. For researchers, that is however good because even steps, tiny steps, tiny improvements have a very high leverage. Now, the total redox equation, uh, which you exploit, is, is shown at the bottom. So typically, you use hematitic oxide. This is Fe2O3. And you typically, when you have seen or remember from your school books, uh, blast furnace, you pump hot air into the blast furnace. That reacts with the sintered and enriched coke and produces carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide percolates upward through that furnace and go through the Boudoir reaction. In the Boudoir reaction, you produce a carbon monoxide, and that is the reductant for these different oxides. They, as you later will see, go through different phase transformations. And currently, annually, uh, you have, uh, at a global scale, about two tons of carbon dioxide production per one ton of metal production. Again, for nickel or so, that is a factor of 10 higher even. Uh, but this is iron. That means that qualifies iron as the biggest, biggest single carbon dioxide emitter on the globe. So it's the biggest source of global warming. What is interesting uh, to contrast that a little bit, when you look at the, when you look at the uh, publication records, when you look at the publication records, we, we learn that you have about, when I checked it for last year, 55,000 papers published every year on the relationship between CO2 emissions and global warming, 55,000 papers every year. But when you look into the research that is done on the biggest emitter for the biggest reason of this global warming, like these sustainable aspects that I've mentioned to you before, you know, you have a few hundred papers, not more. That means there's a lot of headroom to do basic research. Or if, if I would say that harder, I would say, you know, there's simply no research done on these things. We are rather describing the increase in the acceleration of global warming rather than we are solving the problem of stopping CO2 emissions. And that is kind of a surprise to me if you look at these numbers. So the summary of that, you know, is that steel does not only stand for 7% of global energy consumption, but also is about responsible for a third of all the industrial greenhouse gas emissions. So again, big, big numbers speak here. Now on this little um, animation and slide, you see 
you zoom back 3,300 years, it's an interesting turning point in human history when the Battle of Kadesh took place between Ramses II, the Egyptian pharaoh, and the Hittite empire under King Muwatali, because the Hittites, now in today's Anatolia, were the first you know, nation that systematically produced iron as a mass product. And the Egyptians at that time were still in the Bronze Age. So it's an interesting turning point and no, none of these uh, groups uh, won the battle. So it also led one year later to the first ever documented peace treaty, which is now the United Nations building. The point that I wanna make is this redox equation that I showed to you is, is a very old one. And we have now the task within a few years within a few years that are left to us to reduce these enormous CO2 emissions in that industry, which is 3,300 years old and was chemically in principle remained the same. Now, when you take a step, step back and look at this um, you know, playground, then you can appreciate that you have different types of feedstock. In the center, you see these pictures of lump oxides, pellets, fines, but you also have all kinds of industry waste products. I, I mentioned those before. You have scrap, about one third available and so on. But you have, of course, different ways how you can realize a reduction, a chemical reduction through molecules, electrons, ions, uh, protons, and so on. And for that, again, you can use different type of vectors, uh, not only pure hydrogen, but also ammonia, methane, or whatever you can put in a chemical bond uh, from um, um, electrolysis uh, and downstream green chemistry that can act as a vector for carrying hydrogen as a main reducting atom instead of carbon. So that leaves you many, many different possible pathways for doing science. And as I said before, that includes really also uh, particularly our interest to not just realize what is often colportated, namely using scrap instead of, of oxides or ores or sulfides as, as feedstock for the reduction, but also take waste material from industry dumped lamps, landscapes back um, and bring it back into the industry processes. That is often, again, as I said, not so visible because you know what people sometimes don't see, they, they don't realize that it exists, but the quantities our, of our industry waste are so gigantic that this is a very important research topic. So we do meanwhile really research simply on, on waste material, on really dirty waste material. But I think that is the assignment for the future. Otherwise there's never any such thing like a circular economy possible. And the other thing is, of course, when we play with the different carriers that I mentioned, be it electrical power, electrons from sustainable energy providers, or we take it in the form of chemical bonds, as I, as I mentioned before, you, of course, must always blend in what the carbon footprint of the energy is that you use to provide these different reductants. And particularly, as we all know, in Germany, that is currently really, really poor because of the massive use of uh, uh, coal power plants, um, because we simply don't have the electricity. When you just imagine later, when I show you the plasma reduction techniques, when we currently plan in the Ruhrgebiet alone, and the German steel industry is comparably tiny compared to most of other countries, it's very small at a global scale. Then you, you know, you use electrical power or need elect additional electrical power to, to run these plasmas uh, of the order of a town like Dortmund and Duisburg together. So we need huge quantities of, of uh, sustainable electrical power. And that translates to different types of reactors. I later come back to those. You can do direct electrolysis on molten salt oxides, for instance. So I can directly melt an oxide and try to make electrolytic reduction but I don't talk today about this. Then you have the so-called shaft or fluidized bed reactors, which are solid state transformation processes. I talk more about those uh, next. And then of course, plasma reduction in electric arc furnaces. That is something we find very interesting to do. Or you can modify blast furnaces, which however is scientifically uh, a wrong way to go. When you take an overview of, again, maybe thinking back of your school textbooks, then you kind of know how in principle iron making works in a traditional way. You have iron oxides, you go through the sintering of these materials, put them in a blast furnace, go through this um, oxi oxygen feeding and voodoo reaction that I mentioned, then you get a eutectic iron carbon mixture at a relatively low melting point of 1150 degrees centigrade that you tap. And that you put together with schooling scrap in a converter 
where you extract with oxygen the carbon, and that's what you then call steel and can modify it for your alloy and, and cast it and so on. Um, but it's interesting because all this reductant material, the, the fossil carbon is, is, is a reductant, is also partitioned into the iron. So you don't produce iron in the blast furnace, you produce an alloy of iron very high in carbon that you can have to you know, uh, render devoid of the, of the carbon downstream. So you put a lot of reductant in, which you later take out. So all this makes it a very, very dirty process. Now, the other technique I talked to you about in a minute is the so-called direct reduction. I showed later in more detail. And then you can run alone this route here along directly iron ore and scrap mixing and electric arc furnace uh, um, reduction on a plasma basis, or you can do electrolysis. And they all come with different carbon footprint, but I go more into these details now downstream. So currently mainly talk about the use of hydrogen and hydrogen-based plasma reduction of such iron oxides. So when we talk about the so-called direct reduction method, you take solid oxides, and the solid oxides today on the market are relatively pure. So we work mainly with relatively pure materials, also with high purity single crystals as reference materials, etc. But what you see here is a typical commercial pellet. That is kind of a centimeter big little uh, sphere that is sintered, uh, very fine dust-like iron oxide that come typically in our country or in Europe from Brazil and from Australia. And you expose those solids to hydrogen. So that is what we are doing. And that is as a schematic shown here. That means you feed iron oxide uh, spheres, uh, granules into a reactor. It's relatively static. It is heated and then you add the hydrogen and then you create a so-called porous iron sponge that is then downstream melted just uh, to bring it into liquid form. But this is in principle the idea. And you replace then of course a carbon dioxide emission by water production of this liquid. Now, when we look at such a reduction kinetics, and I take your hematite as a reference, we take 700 degree centigrade that is relatively moderate in terms of temperature to, to track the processes a little bit more in detail. And then you go, when you look at the reduction rate as a function of the reduction degree plotted here, you go through different phase transformations. So you start with the hematite, which is a trigonal crystal structure, and transform first into, under, of course, extraction of the oxygen, you extract first the, produce first the magnetite, which is inverse spinel, a cubic crystal structure. And then you go from the spinel very slowly into the wustite, and that transforms very slowly into body-centered cubin iron at this temperature. The wustite is a cubic uh, sodium chloride type of structure with, again, less oxygen compared to the magnetite because you are gradually removing the oxygen out of the structure. But you see from this diagram in principle, the take home message is that you lose one order of magnitude in terms of the reduction kinetics. That is, in other words, a very slow process. And that is, again, in steel problematic because you remember when you do something in steel, it must be scalable to about two to three billion tons per year. That means you must have fast reactions. Here you see a movie that we did two years ago with my colleague, Professor Mark Willinger in an environmental microscope. That means you have the electron microscope is flooded with hydrogen and you see this rough appearing surface that is a wustite single crystal. So we look only at the last stage. And you can see here that this is when exposed to hydrogen in the electron microscope, now readily overgrown by this thin solid iron film. So this is another movie, another snapshot where you see the same feature. You see this rough remaining wustite, and you see how the thin film of freshly formed body center cubic iron is growing over it. Okay. And here's now something fresh out of the microscope that is only two months old, and we still work on the analysis. This is now done in a high resolution uh, scanning transmission electron microscope under full hydrogen flooding done. So that means the entire column of the microscope is, uh, is under hydrogen conditions. And you see when you look closely how on the right hand side, how here, the stop the movie, maybe you can see that here, this little sphere appearing in, in a bright color. And also the rims here are the first iron nucleation sites that we directly observe, so to say, in such a reactor in the, in the electron microscope. And let me maybe show that to you again. And you can can better see that 
So that means you see here how the first iron nucleus is directly formed. Here we are at a low temperature of about 500 degrees centigrade. And uh, that means we directly transform from our single crystalline magnetite. We produce the spinel, uh, uh, sputtered spinel single crystal. And out of that, we go directly below the Wüstheit point in the phase diagram to pure iron. Here we go to the high resolution to atomic column resolution in the environmental microscope. That is quite challenging to do. And you see the first pores where the mass loss, where the individual oxygen vacancies collapse to form pores, nanopores, and they grow a little bit bigger. You see also then where the first iron nuclei are forming, but we are still, but we are still uh, busy, busy with the analysis of these pictures. So for these pictures directly, you cannot interpret too much. There's a lot of follow-up analysis to be done. When I zoom out again a little bit to a somewhat uh, coarser scale, now we have a bar here of three, three micron again and leave the atomic scale for the moment. We now cut such a sintered iron oxide pellet open and look how it looks like in a partially reduced state. We are now in a hydrogen reduced oxide after 30 minutes, 700 degree um, and, and see two millimeters below the pellet surface. The inner area where the bustite is remaining, which needs to be reduced. And you see that very fine outer film of iron around it. That is what you saw before in the microscope movie uh, from the top only. When we zoom but a little bit more in, then you see that dense iron layer around that bustite, as you see here. And you see, of course, all the Swiss cheese porosity in the center where the oxygen has been removed and collapsed. Uh, the free volume has collapsed into this nano porosity. But you can also understand that you need to transport the oxygen for this reduction through that very dense iron layer. And that is a very, very slow transport mechanism, which explains to some extent why this overall kinetics is so sluggish. Here you see a schematic a picture. So when this is your dense iron layer, the first reaction was, of course, at the surface. That is trivial. But then you have the oxygen getting rid of its uh, two electrons, uh, using it to reduce the iron. The iron would relax towards the inner surface. So the iron grows from here from right to left. And the oxygen then as an atom sees the gradient in the chemical potential close to the next nearest surface and will diffuse through that iron layer to react at the next nearest surface to form water. So when you go into detail, that is another high resolution experiment in a hydrogen flooded electron microscopy done here by our Humboldt fellow Digang Chi. Um, then you see that, um, for instance, when we look at the 500 degree centigrade image, that you have a strong dependence on the crystallographic faceting. So you see here that the alpha iron, for instance, with a 210 facet is already readily formed and reduced. Okay. While on this other facet, the 100 facet, you still have the complete oxide layer on top. So that was by purpose oxidized iron nanocrystals to make them visible in the electron microscope. And by that, learn about the role of the crystallographic faceting because of all the transport and reduction kinetics and the catalysis uh, of the H2 splitting depend, of course, on the type of oxide and facet and on these atomic details. So in principle, you must always place that back in a Wolf construction. We also uh, do a lot of DFT and, and MD together with our theory colleagues. Um, and you see also here in a classical reactive force field molecular dynamics simulation, which is not so difficult to run. You can do that in LEMS and the potentials are published. So they enable simple chemical reactions. Um, and you see that also in this MD simulation, you have a transition from a surface reaction to a core shell, to a sluggish core shell structure when the first iron layer has formed in the simulation. Yet um, the thermodynamic, uh, um, say, fidelity of these potentials is very poor. If you just you know, use these potentials to calculate points on the phase diagrams, they're often really pretty wrong. So they, they kind of look, but, but the scientific depth of some of these simulations is still you know, pretty shallow. So there's a lot of development room on the on the theory side to do simply uh, much better potentials, which is for iron and iron oxide due to their magnetic nature, of course, also quite challenging. And currently, uh, a couple of projects pursue that, for instance, uh, by, by machine learning enhanced bond order potentials and similar type of approaches. And of course, we do, of course, also DFT calculations with the theoreticians. So here's a snapshot of the structure when you go 
across the reduction genetics. You start from the left-hand side and the uh, hematite poro structure goes through the nucleation growth of the magnetite, which I said is, is not so complicated to understand. Then you have this phase transformation from magnetite to mustite, which is a very complicated kind of structural spinodal decomposition phase transformation, and then you form the iron. So these crystallographic features alone are really, really interesting and not yet very well understood. When you look into the microstructure, you see in part that when you look at this picture here, that not the entire remaining mustite is surrounded by iron, but you have delamination and fracture also. Um, which is very good for removing the water from the reaction point. You will see that later in more detail. That means we study the details in electron tomography of this porosity that is being formed and the role that it plays for the removal of the redox product. Here's an example. It's just a paper that was only recently accepted. It's now in press, where we studied the closed porosity. That means you have this micro nanoporosity everywhere in the material. And we discovered that when you look at it in, in diffraction, in high resolution transmission electron uh, diffraction, then you see that the inner rim around that pore is reoxidized. So you see that here, that means this material was already completely reduced under the effect of hydrogen. And then it was reoxidized. That means you build up a very high amount and partial pressure of water. Uh, inside of this pore, and that leads to a reoxidation. And you could say, okay, what is the big deal? Why is that so important? And again, if you multiply, you say, okay, that affects two, three, or four percent of the total volume because this thing really looks like a Swiss cheese. And then you multiply that, you know, by uh, two billion tons of steel that are not rendered into metal, then you have your big numbers. Okay. So one question is therefore that we are trying to track where the water is and measuring water at atomic scale, as you all know, is, is, is quite complicated. So we do that uh, with our workflow, with our atom probe workflow, which we have built up over the past 15 years. We have a connected uh, workflow between our atom probes um, and the glove boxes, the gas phase charging stations and the FIP preparation. We do xenon plasma FIP preparation, gallium preparation. And the samples between those are transported in a UHV cryogenic uh, conditions. And we use that, for instance, to use, like you see here, an atom probe tip as a pure style, so FeO single crystal. And then we expose this. These are in principle, you know, 500 million atoms that you see here in principle. We expose them directly to hydrogen gas in our reaction chamber in the atom probe needle stage and track where the water is. You see in the center, the remaining iron oxide of this, say, sandwich structure. So that was by purpose. We interrupted the reduction after one second at 700. And the surrounding is here the uh, as reduced iron. And these yellow patches are the water you see here in the movie. And that means that is for us extremely important. We can also do this in a correlative version with electron microscopy to really nail down where the redox product is formed, how it's transported away, and so on. It's also an interesting percolation problem. This shows you a couple of just of, I don't bother uh, too long with this, but you see a couple of um, analysis in electron tomography, how we track the evolution of this mass loss of the porosity and, of course, of its percolation path. Also here with a fully automated uh, EBSD system that we have built up over 15 years, where a robot is polishing the samples completely autonomously, as you see here, uh, to make 3D sections of larger volumes, then the robot is entirely autonomously charging the specimen into here at size, high resolution scanning, field emission size uh, scanning electron microscope, doing um, the EBSD and electron channeling contrast imaging analysis, and so on and so on, takes the sample out, makes the next slice, and so on. So that means this laboratory runs in, entirely without any and the research and that allows us to do a systematic analysis and labeling of the pore structure and so on. And another thing is, is, is theory on this mesoscopic transport scale. I again have here such a pellet that is again commercial feedstock. And I cut it open. You see that is in principle a sintered ceramic. Okay. And you know, some of your porcelain would look like similar in an electron microscope. You can do the phase analysis, look at the grain boundaries and all the defect content. And then you have a patch with unreduced mustite in the center, the bright appearing iron around it, exactly as, as I showed you before. 
and we cast this now in a, in a ginzburg landau theory. So that is uh, a classical phase field theory where we solve the pan hilliard equation and the uh, pan equations for the phase transformation and for the mass transport and for the chemical reactions. So in principle, you take the Gibbs free energies from your phase diagrams, cast them in the Landau potential, and then you solve the mobility equations for the atoms and solve the uh, phase transformation equations uh, using the n kahn theory. So this is just to show you that this complex coupled, mechanically coupled uh, phase transformation and mass transport phenomena uh, is are also simulated uh, in, in my group. So that is something where we have a lot of experience and then you can track the progress of the iron reduction under such complicated reduction conditions. Uh, what is important just for the experts in case you are interested in things like that, um, we have an elastic and elastic plastic version. So when you take a very simple approximation, you say you take out an oxygen atom out of the oxide, that translates to a gradual change in the lattice parameter before it would transform. Uh, and that can be translated into a displacement gradient. The displacement gradient is a strain. The strain is put into a hook law. So in linear elastic uh, law, and that translates then to a stress, and that stress can be added to the Landau potential. And then you have, of course, unrealistic for these stresses, as you see up to six gigapascal, but of course, the strength of such an oxide is not six gigapascal, but in reality, you have a capping of that stress by a factor of 10 about where the material would become plastic or undergoes fracture and so on. So this type of theory we, we do to, in other words, uh, simulate such redox problems that are the same like in batteries or in corrosion uh, under mass loss um, for elastoplastic conditions. One little side step before I come to the plasma is the ammonia reduction. We do exactly the same things with ammonia. The paper has just only yesterday appeared because often what you see or read in the papers uh, that you know hydrogen is a, is a champagne of the of this. Uh, Green industry uh, is, is maybe sometimes a little bit naive when it comes to the transport costs. And therefore we also work on other vectors, uh, like what I said, like green ammonia or green methanol to, to go through such processes that works also. So you can make green sustainable iron also by using ammonia, when the ammonia is of course made by green hydrogen. But um, then you get mixtures of iron and iron nitrides. And when you melt that in your downstream reactor, just due to vapor pressure, nitri nitrogen goes out and you have pure iron. So you can make pure iron with fertilizers in principle. And that again brings about a nexus between the two biggest industry, namely the chemical industry with ammonia, with the spearheader of uh, CO2 pollution and the steel industry. And there are very interesting research uh, overlaps. A last point about direct reduction is that we also use metallic powders as fuel, as combustion fuel. So US energy experts, of course, know that the energy density of metals is much, much higher than of all the other energy carriers. And you use it, of course, in rocket fuels and so on since long. And against uh, the use of metals, all the like batteries and chemical bonds, are, of course, are very shallow uh, energy carriers. And combusting metals, of course, makes only sense if you have a closed workflow of reducing them again. And so we systematically use that for iron. Uh, with the aim and already doing it to put it into combustion chambers like what you currently do with, with oil and gas in, in power plants. So iron is an industrial future, an interesting future fuel for, for power plants also and has a very high energy density, of course, and is also very harmless as a, as a microparticle. Now we come to plasma reduction. That's one of the many alternative methods I, I referred to in the, in the beginning. So the idea is that we always try to develop new ideas for balancing out the use of hydrogen against the use of electrical energy, because we must not forget when you produce sustainable hydrogen, you must use electrical energy, you have efficiency losses and so on. And we look always for processes where you can balance out the direct use of electrical energy and do not own, only have to go through uh, buffer carriers like, like hydrogen or ammonia and so on. And that is done in such an aggregate. You have an electric arc furnace uh, where plasma is generated and that is fed by hydrogen. Um, but you can also not just feed the oxides that, of course, you want to melt and reduce, but you can also mix it with other feedstock like scrap and so on. We just started doing this some time ago and were very surprised that this works. And it's extremely fast. So when I talk to some of our chemistry colleagues in the Max Planck Society, I say, what do you know about plasma chemistry? Because we didn't know much about it. So we started very naively. 
And all of them said, yeah, okay, so big uh, plasma chemistry is of course very good, very reactive and so on and so on, but such reactors don't exist. And I say, yes, they of course exist. So we, we do already scrap melting today with so-called electric arc uh, furnaces. They operate since long. We have in the European Union 200 of these furnaces operating, but they're used for melting scrap, for melting stainless scrap and uh, steel, you know, that you use in construction, so low-grade steels and so on. Uh, but of course, typically they, they would not operate under um, uh, reducing atmosphere, but this is something that, that can be accommodated also in industry. So it's surprisingly close to industry. So the reactor that we have here is, is a little reactor, of course, where we use typically mixtures of argon and hydrogen with 10%, 8%, 5%, so with very moderate hydrogen partial pressures. Um, then I just started, and you guys know all that much better, of course, I started very naively. I just looked up all the ionization energies, look what kind of radicals do I uh, get at what energy cost and so on, and what ionization cost. Then you get the corresponding free energy distribution. And then again, I naively put this in a boltzmann sar distribution, get my distribution for a certain excitation energy of the different radical forms, and look what the free energy balance, the Gibbs free energy balance for the different oxides would be, and write, write down my, my balance equation, the chemical rate formulations, and that looked all very good. So I say, why not use the plasma? So that, of course, is, is very naive. I know that, but this is, so to say, the base plasma chemistry that I... Uh, that I did in a back of envelope calculation. And we started just a couple of weeks ago to work with colleagues, in this case from Finland, they are OAS experts, uh, to measure in such furnaces uh, with uh, optical emission spectroscopy what the plasma really contains. And I learned that it's pretty complicated to do. So again, forgive me that we are still here pretty much on the layman side, but we learned of course quickly that we have no such thing as an equilibrium um, Plasma, of course, but we have very high iron contamination that is uh, shown here in terms of the color code, but that is by no means quantitative yet. But we have, of course, a high pollution of the due to the evaporation of the elements from that liquid oxide, of course. But coming back to the practical side, we do these reductions, we interrupt these in our furnaces, we can rapidly quench them to analyze the intermediate states, as you see here. So we take out of our little reactor here after one, two, five minutes, that is all done under 10% hydrogen, the samples. And of course, due to the mass density, the, the iron sinks immediately down. Um, and after 10, 15, 30 minutes, you have pure plasma produced iron at a very low hydrogen cost of only five or 10%. So you really, again, balance out the excitation through electrical power and the consumption of the hydrogen. Then we again go through the details of all the micro and nanostructure. I maybe don't bother too long with that. That is maybe for you not too exciting. Here you see quite nicely after uh, five minutes exposure to that hydrogen containing plasma, how already a bigger chunk of iron has formed. That is this bright area. You see that here in the phase contrast, the ferritic iron, so body center curic iron. You can also see then the chemistry, like the silicon is partitioning to these interfaces. And when you again do an atomic scale study here at a frozen in interface between the liquid rustite and on the right hand side, the already formed iron, again, these little dots that you see here are the, are the atoms. So that's an atomic scale atom probe analysis. Then you can see what is for us very interesting that the silicon is as an impurity partitioning into the rustite. So it's not built in into the iron, which is very important that means even from very highly contaminated feedstock, you can produce very, very pure iron. So that's a lot of the kinetics and thermodynamics, of course, we have now to learn. Um, again, handshaking with the point I made in the beginning that we have the ambition of using really dumped industry waste. We do such experiments with industry waste already, uh, with less pure uh, iron oxides because other oxides are at some point no longer available and so on. So it's really, really interesting to learn more about this partitioning. Maybe this is part I skipped. The removal of elements like copper are very important because copper is one of the elements that is too noble. That means you cannot remove it out of iron melts. But we observed in plasma um, liquids that works, in plasma exposed liquids that works, um, because the copper goes through a very complex sequence of oxidation states where it's at some point starts to evaporate. That is just a detail maybe for, for the metallurgical experts that in future we will have to deal with huge amounts of copper coming from the automotive scrap. There's maybe also uh, interesting that is um, the slide where we try to 
balance out the direct reduction that I've shown you before, because we have often a low metallization, a very sluggish transformation. And then in part, we stop the process in between. That is shown here, the arrow in the middle. We take partially reduced oxides and bring them into this plus melting situation to exploit, again, balance out the total energy and hydrogen amount that is consumed. And again, the transfer idea from this plasma melting is that, first of all, these furnaces are in principle existing. And we discussed with companies already about equipping them with these fueling pipes to use reducing gas in, in, these, in these converters. Again, that is all you know, tricky and it can be dangerous because you talk 100 tons upwards. So these are huge aggregates, really dangerous things. And then the question is, what kind of other feedstock reductants do we have and so on? But in principle, it is something that is surprisingly close to industry, if you want. And the idea is when you look at such a, again, gigantic steel factory, you know, that we have everywhere in the Ruhrgebiet, or that is here at the Great Lakes in the United States. And the idea is you can replace this entire steel factory, as we know it, by, by one single aggregate, where you do everything. You just put the oxides in, you put your reducing plasma in. Um, you can alloy, you can put the scrap in, you can put industry waste in. So everything you have, the entire steel factory would be one single uh, plasma oven. So that's our idea, which could be operated by sustainable energy. So I stop here, here a couple of open questions. I leave that for you to read and digest. And thank you very much uh, for bearing so kindly with me. Thank you.